These are the words of Jesus found in the book of Luke, chapter 9. Then he, Jesus, said to them all, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. What does it profit them if they gain the whole world but lose or forfeit themselves? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words, of them the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. These are the words of Jesus. Let it be so. You may be seated. The journey of discipleship always begins with a first step, but we know that it can often be a case of two steps forward, one step back, if not two or three or four or five. Our hopes and our intentions don't always match our actions and results. In a world with a million and one options, and living in a culture where it has become more the norm not to go to church or to claim to be religious, it becomes very easy to lapse and fall away from any intention at all of being a follower of Jesus, of being a disciple. Now before we start to judge all those people who don't come to church, we need to first look into our own hearts for, as I was reminded this week, you and I can't make anyone do anything. <laughs> the only person we have any power over is ourselves. We are each responsible for our own spiritual journey. Jesus warned that we must first take the log of our, out of our own eye before trying to take the speck out of a, the eye of another. Now the backside of this argument is the promise that we made to surround the children that we've been baptizing with a community of faith, answering the question, will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? We said, with God's help, yeah, we can't do it all on our own. With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness. We don't always do a very good job of that. But we promised that we would surround them with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. For those of us who profess to be Christians, we have had promises made on our behalf, some of which were not kept. We have made promises to our children and others in our churches, some of which we've kept and others not so much. Now, we baptize children in the Methodist Church, infants primarily. We baptize people at any point in life, but that is our practice so that we can fulfill this promise to surround them with a community, a Christian community that will love them and cherish them and nurture them in the faith. We might do okay for a couple of years, and while they're right here, but as they grow up, I'm mindful that some of the people that you've made that promise to are 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 and 60 and more years old. The promise never dies. It's never, check, we're done with that one. No. It goes on. 
So we've made this promise and, and not always kept it very well. In other words, we're not perfect at this whole Christian thing. And you know what? That's okay. God already knew that. We're not surprising him at all. That's why he created the church, so that we could help each other on this journey. One of the vital parts about being the church is to hold one another accountable. We don't always do a very good job of that either. Good, luck for, good news for us is that God is in the forgiving and redeeming business. God is an expert at taking our good intentions that have gone wrong, and when we repent of our brokenness, God empowers us with the Holy Spirit to turn the situation around, and we get another chance. Unfortunately, we must deal with the natural consequences of our sinful brokenness, and the consequences of the lack of showing people the heart and mind of Christ has led many of them, many of those people that we kind of deserted, left in the dust, yeah, they, they've come to disregard religion as irrelevant in their lives. What they've heard and seen from Christians doesn't match what they know about Jesus. They're not rejecting Jesus, they're rejecting the country club atmosphere of too many churches where members come together for the purpose of visiting with their friends, gossiping, and doing things that they enjoy. Losing all semblance of denying themselves and taking up their cross daily and following Jesus. Now if you're feeling uncomfortable right now, I refer you to the paragraph before that one. We are not perfect at this being a Christian thing. And fortunately for all of us, God is in the business of forgiveness and redemption. God is an expert at taking our intentions that have gone wrong, and when we repent of that brokenness, empowers us with the Holy Spirit to turn the situation around. However, our willingness to be changed is required. I know you've been hearing me talk about change so long that you're now joking about it. When Nancy wanted to move the table where the refreshments are, Pat's all kidding her. No, you're making me anxious. You're changing things. Well, we've got to take it in a spirit of, okay, whatever it takes. It's not a big deal to move a table. But it is a big deal to want to change enough that we make room in our church for those who are not sure church and God is any place for them. To repent is to want to turn things around. We have to want it. Now do-overs are rarely easy. They're uncomfortable. They require that change in ad adapting to new ways of doing things. This is why some people who call themselves Christian would rather let their church die than to try something new in order to make new disciples for Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. As Jesus said, for those who want to save their life as it is, my parenthesis, they're going to lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake, they're going to save it. Our souls and the souls of our grandchildren depend upon us being willing to learn to follow Jesus as our Lord and Savior in such a way that it makes perfectly clear to everyone that we are not ashamed of Jesus and his words. The persons who have drifted away from worshiping or have never experienced what it's like to gather together with loving Christians for the sake of worship, prayer, and study of God's word, they're in danger. They are in danger. If we care about our friends and our loved ones, we must act. So what do we do? Should we tell them that if they don't start coming to church, they're going straight to hell? I don't recommend that. It's been my experience that threats don't work. 
You can't scare people into following Jesus. Plus, that wasn't Jesus' way. Should we tell them that we're building a nice new coffee bar at church and they should come and try it out? Well, sorry. They've already got a favorite coffee shop. They've already got Big B or Starbucks, and we can't out Starbucks Starbucks. Should we turn ourselves into an after-school daycare, a restaurant serving great dinners, a concert hall providing great music, or any other form of activity that brings people in for entertainment? We could, but that would not make us any more of a church or help them to know Jesus. Now, none of those are inherently bad activities. There's nothing wrong with any one of those things. They have positive attributes like creating fellowship opportunities, but fellowship is not enough. People can get together with their friends anywhere. Young people do it all the time. When we do do those things, it is for the sake of establishing a relationship. Because sharing one's faith works best when you have a relationship of trust with that person. Now this takes time and intention. It requires an investment of ourselves for the sake of making that new disciple establishing that relationship. And we can't do this if we don't take the time. And it's too big a job for the paid staff of any church. Too big a job. It is the work of all disciples to make new disciples. Our Welcome Center needs to be staffed. We need multiple greeters and, and hospitality hosts for every worship service, not just the first service, but the second one as well. This is not just the work of a few. I was reminded this week that churches are often friendly, but being truly welcoming to the stranger takes commitment and connection. And we've missed the mark. The business of the church is to be the church. Yes, that has elements of being a business, managing employees, running a facility, funding its work. Yes, it has elements of fellowship, getting people to know each other and trust one another, and helping each other out when we have a need. But to be the church, we must first be followers of Jesus Christ our Lord. We must take that seriously to the point that we worship him as our Lord. His life must become our life. His way of being, his teaching, his highest good must become our goal in life. Otherwise, we are not true followers. I've known people who were more loyal to NASCAR and professional sports teams than they are to Jesus, and yet they called themselves Christians. Folks, we must raise the bar on what it means to be a member of a church, what it means to call yourself a Christian. We must dedicate our hearts to serving Jesus as our Lord, worshiping him and only him, and serving him with our whole hearts. We say that every month in the communion liturgy, and I just know that it's going right over somebody's head. If we truly believe that he is coming back, as we say in that creed, we need to live whatever time we have left on this earth, doing the things that Jesus has laid out for us. Our goal must be to have the mind of Christ and to become Christ-like. That's what it means to be a Christian. None of us wants to hear him say, Sorry, I never knew you. Depart from me. It is not our job to point a finger or to try to decide who it is that might be hearing that when he returns. Our job is to look at the one person that we have true power over. I am the only person that can change me. You are the only person that you can control or change. 
each of us must examine our own hearts and lives, repent of the things that need to be turned around, and accept God's grace and power to help us live according to the example of Christ. When Jesus is Lord of your life, there is nothing to fear because Jesus' love conquers fear. When Jesus is Lord of your life, priorities change and contentment is found. When Jesus is Lord of your life, a day without spending time in prayer is like trying to live a day without air to breathe. When Jesus is Lord of your life, coming to worship feeds your soul, not because the preaching and music is perfect, but because your heart is open to the Spirit, and God blesses that openness with fulfillment and joy. When Jesus is Lord, you can worship anywhere, because it's not about an external environment creating a mood or emotion. It's about the love of Christ in you, bringing the spirit into that place and transforming the ordinary to become extraordinary. You may be in a beautiful sanctuary, but a humble stump in the woods or a crumb-covered kitchen table or a worn-out meeting hall can be a holy place when the Holy Spirit is there. Gathering together with other Jesus followers, wherever that may be, reveals the presence of the living Christ. Wherever two or more are gathered, wherever two or more are gathered. When Jesus is Lord of your life, hope gets you through those difficult times. You trust him to get you through this time because you remember all those other times that he did. Our hope is not in an institution, any institution. It is in Jesus, who died at the hands of political and religious people who were afraid of losing their power and control. Our hope is in Jesus, who three days after he was killed was raised from the dead. He appeared to his followers. He let them touch his hands and his side to prove to them that it was him. Jesus revealed to them the miracle of eternal life, that death is not the end. God has the power to raise us as well. Again, every month we say, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Do you believe it? I hope so. New life in Christ is free but not cheap. God's grace is available for all, but it comes at a cost. Jesus said, those who lose their life for my sake will save it. What does it profit them if they gain the whole world, but lose or forfeit themselves? Our hope is in God who came to earth incarnate. Our hope is in following Jesus as Lord of our lives. The peace he gives is far greater than anything the world can give. Doesn't matter how rich you are. Living in the light of his love, sharing that light, this is what it is to be the church. Amen.